be sure to wash your hands. It all will be well. Is now the new title and Imaginaries of Risk is the subtitle. Well, we live in dark times. We have the war in Ukraine. We have COVID-19. We still have climate change. We have a film called Don't Look Up. And we have, of course, still the lingering, festering problem of Trumpism. And all these things are related. A fire broke out backstage in a theater. The clown came, to, uh, came out to warn the public. They thought it was a joke and applauded. He repeated it. The acclaim was even greater. I think that's just how the world will come to an end, to general applause from wits who believe it's a joke. And that's a quote from Søren Kierkegaard uh, about 160 years ago. Okay, a bit too fast. Science is no longer what we were thought it used to be. Whilst at least since humans have started writing history, planet Earth is facing unprecedented challenges that may result in the end of the world as we know it, there is simultaneously a looming apocalyptic sense of our growing impotence to turn the tide. Franco Berardi's concept of impotence is indeed a highly adapt tool for understanding how crises are communicated and perceived today. In this contribution, I will analyze one meme that can function as a useful example to expose the impotence of crisis communication and the banality of our apocalyptic predicament that this engenders. My son has pointed out that this is not a meme, but a character caricature, but I need the word meme because I want to relate it to my nieces. The ironic overcoding of the meme, which signals a series of crises, COVID, economic recession, climate change, in the form of three sequential tidal waves, is both an affirmation of a critique of our lack of concern for the bigger picture, as well as a withdrawal of commitment, exposing a nihilistic core of impotence. I will contextualize this meme with a reflection on a risk society 2.0, which is characterized by an implosion of epistemic practices and a corresponding abnegation of responsibilities. Three tsunami-like waves threaten a city on a small island, and the first to arrive is the smallest and bears the name COVID-19. It is this, to this wave that an announcement in the form of a speech balloon declares that be sure to wash your hands and all will be well. And this meme first appeared a few weeks after various European nations went into lockdown. The mood in the USA was far more defiant as the president at that time, Donald J. Trump, preferred to downplay the severity of the threat, even though the infection and mortality rates in New York City and various other cities were increasing rapidly. Already at the time of the meme, the washing of hands as a means to impede the growing pandemic was considered somewhat farcical. Given the rather alarming mortality and infection rates, of course. As the image suggests that the entire island is likely to be engulfed by the tidal wave, the underestimation of the actual risk caused by COVID-19 is the, at the core of the meme's irony. The irony of this image, however, is extended by the fact that COVID-19 is only the first and smallest of three waves. The second wave, called recession, will strike as soon as COVID-19 tsunami has taken place. Early into the pandemic, many governments implemented lockdowns and enforced quarantines. Business analysts predicted economic recession and stagflation as the impact of the pandemic would be merely affect public health, but also the economy. And I'm going to return to this word, the economy. Indeed, COVID-19 has seriously affected many small businesses and self-employed workers, especially in the gastronomic hospitality and independent performance entertainment sectors, such as concerts, festivals, theater, opera. The third wave, however, is the last and the biggest one. It's called climate change and refers to the way in which COVID-19 seems to have made us forget. The chain reaction of events associated with rising temperatures of the oceans, the earth and the air, including the already alarming slump in biodiversity, which negatively affects ecological self-regulation and resilience. Being significantly larger than the recession and COVID-19 tsunamis, it also serves as a commentary on our, um, on our priorities. The order of the sequence of tsunamis itself is also significant, as not only is it logical, but also ascending 
thus suggesting that things will get worse. As we've already un un been underestimating the very first wave, which later became clear to be a recurrent phenomenon with all subsequent waves related to viral mutations and seasonal change, we are completely blind to that which is to follow. Myopic perception is a generic feature of risk perception. And as we are much more likely to notice hazards that are more visible and emerge in closer proximity to us, it is also caused by a lack of lateral, critical and analytic thinking, which characterizes the entertainment industries as already exposed uh, almost 80 years ago by Adorno and Horkheimer. The waves, however, are logically connected. The COVID-19 pandemic most likely arrived by accident, hence it appearing from nowhere. But it is causing a serious recession, except of course, amongst the filthy rich, a term to which I will return as well. And this in turn will make structural reforms to stave off the worst of the coming ecological crisis increasingly unlikely, as these will further damage the economy. And of course, there's no Ukraine war in here, but you can now already read in newspapers and commentaries that uh, people think that returning to coal energy will be a good answer to dependency on, on gas and oil. So we can clearly see that, that the, the myopism, right? We've, we're in war, forget about the environment is, is once again there. Hence the meme suggests, right? That um, uh, a process of accelerationism Every response exacerbates the fatal strategy that triggered it. In the race between the rocket science in, that is intended to secure the safety of the filthy rich and the planetary destruction they have helped to cause and now trying to escape from, the latter is an odds on favorite to arrive first. So I don't think the rockets are going to be ready in time to take Elon Musk and, uh, and other rich people, uh, Jeff Bezos and whatever, to a far distant planet where they can start again. A few words on words. I've used two words and they are rhetorical words. First, the economy. With the economy, I refer to a deceptive term deployed to suggest the general unity of common interests while deflecting from the actual particular interests that are being served. So whenever people talk about the economy, you could also basically replace it with rich people's yacht money, right? So, oh, what happens to the economy? What happens to rich people's yacht money, right? Because the economy is a very deceptive kind of concept. The filthy rich is a second concept, which I use as an analytical category. So not as elites, but an analytical category that designates not a concrete group of people, but instead a desire cultivated and propagated by culture industries for absolute sovereignty and is as such ideological. And this desire is most commonly found in the various demands for reclaiming lost privileges, such as those of white supremacy or patriarchy under the heading of freedom, as well as in the hedonism of identity politics of consumption and self-presentation. The concept of filthy rich as a desire thus amplifies the resonance of impotence and it should not be surprising that one prevalent response to experiences of impotence has been the development of conspiracy theories around an actual globalist elite as the absolute evil. So why do people put in at the heart of the conspiracy theories a global elite? It is because they desire to be part of that. They desire to be the filthy rich. So this is my overview. Uh, I'm not going to read it out because you know, that's what I'm doing, but it has a structure. And I would like to briefly go to Franco Berardi on impotence. And this is a quote. Physical, affective and historical events are slowing the pace of, brain and, uh, of the brain as mind. And in a dissonance between the speed of the world and the slowness of the mind, there is a suffering, which is the dark sign of desire. But desire is not only energy and speed. It is also the ability to find another rhythm. So clearly we are on a path, Birardi says, on a path to nowhere in the sense that all the things we seem to be doing, trying to catch up with the speed of the world, the speed of technology, so to speak, and our own slowness, and you could call this the slowness of culture, right? To understand this, right, creates an increasing gap 
And this gap feels like impotence, right? Because we cannot keep up with this. And it, it generates an energy, it generates uh, a speed um, that is a, in effect destructive, right? The speed within ourselves and an urgency to speed. And so, for example, you know, the, the shock with which people reacted to the invasion in Ukraine is basically because they couldn't keep up with the snippets of news that have been coming out of the Ukraine, have been coming out of Russia, has been coming out of the mouth of Putin, right, in the past 15 to 20 years. And now people are starting to puzzle the story back together, retelling the story. You could see it happening all along kind of a story. But again, it's way too late. And it only feeds into our impotence, sense of impotence. We can't do anything about it. And so this concept of impotence relates very strongly to what Bernard Stiegler calls entropy. He sometimes also calls it negantropy. Right? And again, entropy is kind of the, the um, second law of thermodynamics, that everything strives towards entropy, everything strives towards expansion. And this expansion at the same time is also loss. And Stiegler refers to this loss of the ability to control events, the ability to take charge of history, the ability, if you like, to live harmoniously on this planet. Stiegler calls that proletarianization. And it's not just that the poor are being proletarianized, everyone is. And so this, is, this puts a different perspective on, on the filthy rich or on conspiracy theories, right? So the fact that Jeff Bezos right, is manically accumulating billions and billions of dollars in order to, to fund a space program, in order to escape the, the damaged planet because it's going to collapse, that itself is proletarianization. The filthy rich kind of have given up. They are not in control right, of what is happening. Nobody is. And so this is about being unable or being disabled. And the example uh, you could here raise, and this is, of course, for the conference quite important, is the idea of scientific knowledge related to such risks as, for example, pandemics or biochemical weapons or nuclear weapons or nuclear plants or, indeed, um, the entire um, environment. Real imaginations. In this contribution, I intend to use the aforementioned meme as an example of risk communication, which itself is a substantial subsection of science communication. And as a relatively recent research object of media and cultural studies, memes are not yet colonized by an established canon of disciplinary hermeneutics. And we can only hope it stays that way. So I am not going to do a semiotic analysis of the meme. Therefore, I do not seek to subject the meme to such as the one above, um, to some kind of functional media analysis, trying to reduce it to one or other media logic. Instead, I want to retain its heteroglossia, that is the multiplicity of voices, and its inherent fluidity. Instead, therefore, I treat memes as real imaginations. And in doing so, I hope to reinvigorate an interest in Louis Althusser's defin definition of ideology as the imaginary relationship of human beings to their real conditions of existence. Imaginary, however, should be understood in an active sense, is the effect of a process of imagination and not as merely deceptive projections onto the wall of Plato's imaginary cave. The real problem always is to present realities as if they simply self unfolded, as if they are simply there. Image, imaginary and imagination both evolve around images. Images are closely related to imitations as the latter belong to the broad family of mimesis. Mimesis is that which enables or brings forth a work of art often considered in terms of representation, which itself is a form of imitation. In this sense, there is a close affinity between science and art as both engage with mimetic operations of translating experiences not necessarily empirical ones, into expressions. So translating experiences 
into expressions. Following Heidegger, Gianni Vattimo referred to art as the setting into work of truth. The setting into work of truth. And the setting to work may be different for the sciences in terms of methods and modalities, but the histor historically rather than conceptually close affinities between the arts and the sciences, between poesis and techne, so to speak, have been cultivated continuously up until the present day. So it should be made clear from the outset that this analysis refutes the assumption that reality and imagination are separate universes. Instead, we should consider them as dimensions folded into each other. Jacques Lacan differentiated between the real, the imaginary, and the symbolic to describe a passage of subjectivation the becoming of subjects as entering into language. However, this entire approach to psychoanalysis is based on the assumption that although entering into language makes a return to the real as such impossible, it still involved the real as an experience of desire. Between the symbolic and the real is the imaginary. It is that which bridges desire and its expressions, and enables the object of desire to be withdrawn from experience as lack or transferred into something else. The meme described in the introduction moves us back from the symbolic, in this case, the ironic description of impending catastrophes to that which feels much more at home in the imaginary, risks. Risks are not actual in terms of what uh, that which might happen as already happened, but then they would be mere catastrophes. Risks instead, are into anticipations of the realization of possibilities that are considered negative. The imaginary can be thought of as a liminal passage, a milieu, as that which connects places between desire and expressions and manifests itself primarily through the affects. The, prim the primary affective charge of imageries, imaginaries, sorry, of imaginaries of risks may be fear, but the aforementioned meme adds something to it irony. The irony is the doubling of the sequence of risk and its flippant greeting by the island city. Irony, however, seems from a to come from a place outside rather than in between. It enables a critical voice without having to reveal the place of assumed superiority from which it stems. Irony does not commit itself to such a place. How can something be both in between and beyond, or perhaps neither in between nor beyond? And this question was raised by Derrida in his discussion of Plato's treatment of Cora in the Timaeus, in the dialogues of Timaeus, and led him to conceptualize this treatment as revealing the corrupted reasoning that was required to come to terms with this impossible place, which takes on the form of a dream, that is, an imaginary without an image. The corruption of the dualism of logos and mythos. Putin is the champion of that, right? So he speaks and he speaks kind of within a language that seems reasonable, but constantly infused with all kinds of myths, right? Um, so the mythological is very strong in kind of the, the Russian imaginary of the invasion of the Ukraine. The corruption of the dualism of logos and mythos is what haunts the real imaginations of risk. As risks are virtual, their existence is suspended in time, but not indefinitely. Just as the meme is still an image and enables us to see what is to come without it seemingly ever coming, its imaginary works beyond the irony, because it does not stem from nowhere. It has been given a place, perhaps akin to given birth, by processes that are not confined to the iconicity of the meme, Pragmatics would call this motivation. By pointing beyond the actuality of impact, risk, however, still points towards that actual occasion of impact as a real possibility, and in doing so becomes an actual occasion itself. The range of effective charges of risk is also not infinite and are primarily negative, that is fear, anxiety, apprehension. But in the case of this meme, there are additional effective charges, not just irony, but possibly also cynicism. The mind boggling stupidity with which society seems to flippantly accept 
the coming catastrophes by assuming that we can merely continue with what we are doing and all will be well, does not seem to invoke anger, but instead a wry smile of resignation. And so we come to the core of the paper, Why Risk Society 2.0? When the late Ulrich Beck wrote his seminal work, The Risk Society, its subtitle was Towards Another Modernity, and this was generally perceived as a sign of hope. I've heard it today as well. There is still hope. The Risk Society was like a wake-up call and would only be a temporary phenomenon or to speak with Antonio Gramsci, a hegemonic interregnum, in which the old state of affairs had already died, but the new has not yet been born or could not yet been born. Again, there's a, with a cannot be born is like impotence right there. The old state of affairs, Beck called the first modernity, and it's basically described the world of industrial capitalism. The new state of affairs then was called second modernity and then, and then reflexive modernity, and finally the cosmopolitical. Whereas in the beginning, Beck's writing suggested that the new world order was already in ascendance, was already coming. He became more normative in his later writings by arguing that we should do more to realize and actualize a true cosmopolitical society. And here is a, is an interruption of my own paper. I would really want to urge you all to not replace a lack of concrete solutions with a wish list of things you would like society to be or do, right? What we want as sociologists, how we see the world and what we think is a good world, right? it's a political statement. Nobody is going, going to take us more seriously than they're going to take other politician, politicians seriously. So as sociologists, we are extremely weak in the realm of politics. Whereas the warnings of the risk society turned out to be prophetic, the follow-up can hardly be described as the realization of another modernization or um, modernity or cosmopolitics or whatever. Beck, Giddens and Lash um, have actually failed in that, in that project to steer the political towards a world that they wish to see happen. Instead, against the odds, the hegemonic interregnum has morphed into what Mark Fisher has referred to as capitalist realism. The neoliberal power grab of the late 1970s has been consolidated into a globalized political economy that is accelerating at a descent into a possible complete oblivion of human life on Earth in its current form has now become entirely unsustainable. We seem to firmly entrenched into life forms in which capitalism is itself the reality, or as Latour called it, second nature. And Latour said the second nature seems to be more deterministic, less prone to change, not susceptible to intervention compared to the first reality. Now, you're all, most of you are quite young and you may not exactly remember the, uh, the finance crisis of 2007, 2008. But at that time, again, the economy was talked about as if it was kind of, kind of reality as such with its own nature, that we humans could hardly change. We could only feed it, right? Feed it more money, so to speak. So capitalist realism has no alternatives, simply because reality has no actual alternatives. Reality only has fantastical alternatives. To speak of another modernity is simply to leap into a realm of fantasy, like that of a conference seminar, in which people who perhaps consider themselves a lot more important than they actually are, freely discuss what kind of world we would like to live in before lamenting that this is unrealistic. This is what cosmopolitanization has become, a negative dialectic to speak with Adorno, a mere discourse of self-deception, primarily functioning to distract the persistent belief in human reason from the, um, uh, distracted from the, brutal reality of its persistent failures. The idea that too much enlightenment blinds you was offered by Adorno and Horkheimer's dialectic, Dialectik der Aufklärung, the dialectic of enlightenment. And even after 80 years, this text still stands as remarkable working. Through the, the very metaphor of Aufklärung, 
uh, as a kind of parody of Plato's allegory of the cave, Plato himself already suggested that the light of truth blinds, but he assumed that with proper training, the philosopher would get used to it. The thinkers of the enlightenment had merely repeated the same arrogant modality of self-deception when they proclaimed their reasoning to have the capacity to not simply liberate humanity from God, nature, and fate, but to instrumentalize these three powers to serve the progressive emancipation of mankind. Of course, all of this had already been pointed out by a variety of critiques that have been labeled post-modernism, many of which were indeed mere echoes of Adorno and Horkheimer's early insights. However, dismissing post-modernism as a mere fad or a fashion, the thinkers of alternative modernities that have dominated sociological theory since the 1990s have not really managed to convince decision makers that they should be taken seriously. Perhaps facing reality has now become reality. The time of another modernity is over. And to speak with Bernard Stiegler, there is a paradox in the speed of calculation that is the incalculable as risk as accident. But there is also another incalculable that is a form not of a faulty anticipation, a lack of foresight, but rather the very time in which risk is also chance. It is this risk that industrial urgency tends to eliminate in engendering only partially incalculable, trivially catastrophic risks that haunt today's public opinion. So let's not forget the thing that everybody seems to have forgotten who are going down risk society theory. Namely, every risk entails an opportunity, a chance, right? Probability is also a chance, and the chance has been taken, has been, has been colonized, so to speak, right? And, and not by us. Means, such as the one described earlier, does reveal our collective impotence. To, to, to quote Berardi, the aestheticization of contemporary culture may be read as a symptom and a metaphor of fragility, endless flight from one object of desire to another, overload of aesthetic stimulation, invasion of the public sphere by aesthetically arousing advertising. The present shifts away, impossible to touch or to savor, as the flows of neurostimulation push forward towards a never becoming future. The emotion that comes from the near body is blurred by frantic impulses coming from afar, continuously reclaiming our attention. Reduced to mere fantasies, alternatives have lost their ability to inspire collective action. The second nature of capitalist realism has succeeded in subjugating political being to the management of acceleration and decline. Impotence is the consequence of negative dialectics. By absorbing everything that stands in its way, capitalist realism has turned into a universal fatal strategy. All that remains, however, is not nothing. Mankind may indeed be capable of ruining Earth to the extent that it can no longer sustain human life as we know it. Life will still remain. Whether trapped in an underground bunker or in spaceships fleeing the dying planet, the filthy rich will, of course, gamble that their kleptocracy, that is the rule of thieves, is also sustainable, but who will remain and be willing to clean up their filth? All that remains, therefore, is not simply resentment projected onto some notion of karma, but an actual organizational problem. To sustain post-apocalyptic life forms, one must already engage in strategic planning now. And the vast amounts of wealth shifted from public sectors into private ownership via carefully constructed fiscal legislation, a mere tip of the iceberg of which has been revealed by the so-called Panama and Pandora Papers, are undeniably proof that the filthy rich are indeed planning for post-apocalyptic futures. The triple tsunami of COVID, recession and climate change not only shows the fatalistic impotence in combination with blasé irony of capitalist realism, but also the cynical opportunism that enables decision makers to both recognize the dangers and seemingly doing nothing. This is because they are actually doing something, preparing for the great escape. The fact that the filthy rich have accumulated unsurpassed amounts of wealth during the COVID pandemic should suffice as evidence for this. 
And of course, this is also inspired now by, by the film, Don't Look Up. Right? If you haven't seen it, I, I strongly recommend it because in a funny, interesting way, it summarizes what for me, Risk Society 2.0 is. However, this is not all that remains. Blase irony of the meme also suggests something else that lies beyond the meme and the mere resignation of impotence. Whether it is a little chuckle, a profound or even smug sense of vindication, or a repressed sense of anger in the light of a hopeless situation, there is still affect at work. Even if those affected may only experience an amplification of their impotence in the face of the fatal strategies of capitalist realism, the mere occurrence of this affectedness is in itself significant. Following Spinoza and the way his Tractatus has been taken up by Hart and Negri, primarily following Deleuze and Guattari, effect, affects can be understood as setting into motion or motivation. Memes go viral because their affectivity is infectious. They motivate. When irony becomes virulent, it exposes its own impotence as a force of virulence, thereby showing us a glimpse of what we thought we had lost, a desire for collective political efficacy. The so-called freedom convoys can thus be understood as a force unleashed by such a desire, which, because it was fueled by large amounts of um, resentment for the loss of white male privilege, functions as an accelerator of the impotence of life in capitalist realism. So we know from the responses, for example, right, those who, who uh, oppose the corona legislations or those who um, are going in these trucks and, and blocking kind of roads and, and uh, talking about kind of taking your country back and whatever, without, all from, from right-wing extremism, but to fuel people, to motivate people to do such things suggests there is something there. There is a desire and there's a mode of affection, there's an affectedness at work. It goes in the wrong direction, that's for sure, but there is something still left, right? So these, these convoys, of course, are extremely well funded. Um, and it suggests, however, the fact that they are strongly funded, the fact that they are organized by extreme right-wing groups, that they are supported by extremist right-wing politics, and that extreme right-wing politics, again, in, the, in turn, are supported by filthy rich, suggests that the filthy rich may not be so confident that their own fatal strategies will work. The acceleration of the apocalypse through globally organized right-wing extremism might be a sign that they realize they are running out of time. So how do I explain Putin's invasion of the Ukraine? He realized he's running out of time. Right? Putin, Putin sits on an enormous amount of wealth. right? And what are you going to do with this wealth when the planet is going to go down the drain? Right? So you need to accelerate accelerate this, you know, secure kind of your, your future. Uh, and the future is coming very quickly. So you need to act fast. So the final section is called matters of concern. Memes as a form of risk communication, therefore, are not to be dismissed as mere affirmations of impotence. Or better, affirming impotence is not necessarily increasing impotence. The amplification of risk as a virtual occurrence pointing towards a possible future is anchored in real imaginations. The negative dialectic of the enlightenment may indeed have motivated an epidemic of blindness so vividly embraced by the foot soldiers of global right-wing extremism, it cannot completely eradicate the stench of the filthy rich. Wash your hands and all will be well will not be enough to get rid of the smell of the cesspit of capitalist realism. Risks open up the need for epistemic practices. Whereas these can be political, religious, philosophical, or scientific, it is wrong to assume that anything goes. This is because as real imaginations, risks are virtual and thus also material. In order to pass as a convincing account of risk, an epistemic practice will have to be tested against objections. One key thing, the COVID um, uh, opponents don't do um, is test their own objections, right? They are not tested. So 
where am I? Because it is specialized in practices of objectification, um, that is because it is, its epistemic practices are driven by a desire to engage with the materiality of objectification, natural sciences have a clear advantage here by seeking to enable non-human actors to act as witnesses, that is by making them speak, they are less able to impose an arbitrary hermeneutic frame onto their research. Their hermeneutics have to engage with all testimonies, including those of non-humans. And this is kind of Latour's main insight, right? Whereas, of course, it is still possible to ventriloquize like a speaking puppet, right? These witnesses, right, to make these witnesses say what you want them to say, the, the risks of being exposed as fraudulent because of a lack of objectification are considerable. So scientists who are exposed as frauds, different from politicians, different from religious preachers, scientists who are exposed as frauds are finished. It is not that religious epistemic practices are devoid of objectifications. Of course, for although there are lots of preachers who are exposed as frauds, they can carry on as preachers, it is problematic in a wider religious sense. Right? For example, the occurrence of miracles or demonic possessions are equally subject to proof. So you cannot just simply get an exorcist if you say I'm demonically possessed. It needs to be tested first that you're not just simply mentally ill. What is interesting, however, is at least the Catholic Church tries to, to the assessment of miracles or demonic possessions to follow the same logic as that of scientific research and often even involve scientists. So before you can even get an exorcism, you need to see a psychiatrist. This is because such assessments concern the objectivity of these occurrences. So the Catholic Church is interested in the objectivity of miracles and demons. Right? And therefore, they need to be tested. Right? They must therefore enable the taking place of objections. Similarly, as we've seen during the COVID pandemic, political decisions regarding the management of public health, and even those that try to diminish the risks, are also strongly focused on scientific practices. For example, Trump's advocacy of hydroxychloroquine as a prophylactic remedy against COVID-19 it didn't work for him, by the way, right? as you remember. But anyway, right? it was still embedded in claims related to scientific evidence, which were seriously researched and discussed in peer-reviewed journals and the US National Institute of Health, who, on the basis of all that research, declared that hydroxychloroquine was not a good remedy and not a good prophylactic against COVID-19. The materiality of objection closely connects to the materiality of effect. When combined, they constitute what Bruno Latour refers to as matters of concern. The meme of the, the three tsunamis generates a matter of concern, demonstrating a risk that COVID-19, recession, and climate change are connected events and their succession can be logically explained. What unites them is capitalist realism. Dismissing this matter of concern has, has been the primary objective of both the neoliberal hegemonic interregnum as well as their global fascist challengers. But whereas these two massive power blocks squabble over the management of the cesspit, the filthy rich still try to escape and slip away unnoticed. Matters of concern are resilient, however, and tend to expand when being ignored or repressed. And that was the core paradox of the Risk Society 1.0. It's still alive and well. What Beck did not pay enough attention to, perhaps, is how matters of concern expand. In an early work, I deployed the concept of virulence, not as a metaphor, but to designate how risk functions as flow. In this sense, it is very similar to the Lozo Guattarian notion of desiring machine and the actor network theory concept of translation. Virulence is an affect that adds to without adding up. Reassembling the social, as Latour called it, requires the virulence of matters of concern. Why else should the social be reassembled? The speed of digitalized media has attained an intensity and that bypasses not only cognition, but also calculability itself. The sense of impotence is no longer exclusively a matter of not knowing what is actually going on, but of sensing that the future has already come to pass. This is the main lesson from Don't Look Up. 
That is the predicament of the risk society 2.0. The time out of ironic commentary has been exposed as being timed out. No commit, non-commitment is not an option, not because of its moral deficiency, but because of its boundedness to past futures. The future is in the past, so to speak. If describing our current predicament as risk society 2.0, rather than capitalist realism, enables a concretization of filthy rich as the desire, rather than the international conspiracy. And then we need to pay very close attention to the virulence of matters of concern, that is, to that which produces and the sequence of imminent catastrophic events. It also requires us to add to the manufacturing of impotence into the mix. Here, one of Beck's pivotal insights, namely that the impotence of the risk society is produced by the inertia of nationalism, can actually be very helpful. The main reason why politics have become impotent is because the filthy rich cannot be stopped by border patrols. Just as fiscal laws have been extremely conducive in undermining the monopoly of taxation upon which nation states were built, so the shift has the shift um, has, has been shifted towards pure war. Right, so the nation state has no control over the financial infrastructure, and instead is continuously engaged in a process of, of pure war, as Frelio calls it. And this shift towards pure war terminated the nation state's monopoly of violence. In the risk society 2.0, a third monopoly has been eradicated, the monopoly of knowledge, which was believed to be the domain of science. It's no wonder then that the impotence has become so virulent. By stressing impotence as a core matter of concern, however, we may be able to embrace the virulence in a different way. It is the desire of the filthy rich that makes us impotent, but this desire is also that which unites us in our objection, with an A, not an O. Rather than trying to hold on to the privileges that enable the filthy rich to get away with murder, our salvation lies in their objection. This also means that rather than avoiding risks, we should be taking them. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor, for a very interesting, stimulating uh, discussion. I think you um, draw upon some very interesting points that have already been uh, um, widely talked about and debated already for, for years on the, let's say, left intellectual side. Uh, John Samomatsu talks about it, Slavo uh, Zizlek, Svetko Horvat as well. Um, I see we already have some questions right on the chat, so I won't prolong with my um, review of the, of the discussion and um, we'll continue later on if nobody else has questions. So somebody in the chat box asked, I'd like to pose a question for the following discussion. Are there any more recent theoretical solutions, not merely for the critique of the present capitalist realism and its disruptive nature, but also for articulating and developing practicing, so to speak, emancipatory change? Thank you in advance. Emancipatory change, yeah. Of course, there are books being written. I wouldn't go as far as calling them theories. One thing of the input, what points towards the impotence is there is an abundant absence of theoretical innovation that suggests, you know, uh, clear that, that cl uh, paint clear pathways towards futures. One thing, of course, we've learned, I think this is the, the debacle, if you like, of, of sociology at the end of the 20th century, when people like Anthony Giddens were very close to the political powers in, in Great Britain, particularly Tony Blair's New Labour. But I also think of the Clinton administration, perhaps. There was at that time in the 1990s, a sense of optimism that somehow we could have economic prosperity and increasing social justice. There was this idea that can be done both. And of course, we were all tricked, right? Uh, that was kind of the last trick um, that was there is kind of um, the idea that somehow um, we are rational beings and we would see that there are limits to, to, um, to what we can do with the planet and limits to social injustice. And that somehow people are clever enough or, and that's the alternative, of course, morally good enough to change that. And, and for me, the, 
the person who symbolizes the last kind of bastion of this idea of emancipatory change was um, Jürgen Habermas. He really believed that if only we could somehow bracket out all those nasty interests related to money and power and women and whatever, men of good standing would sit at a table and discuss rational solutions. I've become very cynical, I know that. And I know that this is not good stuff for a conference because you have a, a speaker who says, well, I don't know. But here's, this, here's the message of hope. At least far more people are not going to be on those, play, those rockets going to other planets when the planet collapses, right? The vast majority of people will not be there. So in that realization, Maybe there is something else going on. Like in Russia, the vast majority of people do not want war. That is why Putin is lying to them and saying, it's only an invasion, guys. We're only trying to get these, uh, these fascists out, right? If, if the people of Russia wanted war, there would be no censorship. They would broadcast every bombardment of every city. You know, they would celebrate the maiming of women and children. Of course they don't. So... So here is the hope. That is not a theory that someone has written. This is my hope. It comes from the paper. If dictators feel they need to lie to us, if, if they cannot do anything else but lie, it means we have, a, we have a chance to win it. Right? Because it's not exposing the lie, of course. It's to realize why they're lying. And in the realization why they're lying, we might indeed, maybe not emancipatory, but might indeed build um, a, a, a strong enough force to, um, to, to get their trillions of dollars back into, back into public ha uh, hands. Uh, it, requires, it requires a massive global shift. It requires basically a, an enormous amount of, of, of political change. We need to, to put bankers in prison and things like that, right? It, it needs to happen because otherwise, and we need to get new fiscal lawyers who are not interested in making money, but interested in justice and all those things. And I know it's all idealism, but at least the majority of us are affected by it. So maybe this will unite us in doing something about it. If I can have a short comment, uh, please, if it's possible. Of course. Um, oh, Eric, you have a, you have a question? Yeah, uh, I will just comment uh, what uh, you just uh, said. Did I uh, pronounce it correctly this time? Almost. Yoast. Oh, Yoast. Oh. Uh, yeah, uh, what you were uh, saying, I, I saw a lot of pessimism in your hope and optimism because basically you just uh, told us the catch-22. Uh, the elites have to change their ways so the uh, majority will, would be more educated. But if we would like to be educated, they should change. So it's basically- No, no, no it's, not, Eric, uh, it's not about education. Yeah, education I, I just said, said it as, as an example, because uh, they're lying to us, but uh, the problem is that their lies are working. The war is happening. Yeah, yeah, and, so uh, their, their lies are working, but at the same time, they're constantly locking people up. So mm -hmm. more and more people are being locked up. At some point, Russia is going to build new prisons, right? How many people are going to are, are they going to lock up? And of course, I know that this is it's kind of you have to go through the entire route of pessimism. This is Zizek, right? Mm -hmm. You have to go through the entire tunnel and realize that the light at the end of the tunnel coming at you is another train, in order to realize what it is that we're doing. So I do not think. There is a point in what Schwarzenegger is trying to do where others send messages to Russia in Russian saying they're lying to you. Because if someone says they're lying to you, right, then you think, well, you could be lying too. The problem is you need to realize why they might be lying to you. That's far more important. Why are these wars called special operations? Why are, we, we, are there no independent media in Russia? Why are people... Putting in jail, put in jail for treason when they say we don't want war. All those things, all these whys, is not education, it's affect. So mm -hmm. doubt is an affect. And doubt is the first kind of instance 
where you may actually realize that there are alternatives that, that, that nobody wants to know us, or, or nobody, that, that are there, that are actually not so hard to think about. So it's not about education. I think education is over. There's no point. We can, we can all be clever. We can have brilliant seminars. We can explain the entire world. It's not going to, that's not going to change the world. But putting bankers in prison might, right? Uh, that might actually, so pursuing one particular path, for example, fiscal law, to get those people who use the system to evade tax, expose them, and then ask why are so many politicians having so many bank accounts in the Bahamas Every change has to be local, after all. So every ch so, like your local politician is a is a corrupt politician. He's taking money from a friend who has a company, and then you know the company gets the order to build a, a play park or whatever, right? Throw him in jail, right? Fight them, fight them with the system, and you do this locally first. And it's a constant kind of drive at corruption, and you may unearth something, right? The cockroaches may start running. So I know that the that the filthy rich are panicking. Because otherwise, we won't have so much fascism in the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you, Eric, for your question. Uh, and thank you also, Professor Van Mond, for your answer. Does maybe anybody here and the public in person have uh, a question? I see one hand in the air. Please speak up and then. Yes, uh, can you hear me? Maybe. Yes, I can. So my question is, OK, we. Uh, we cannot uh, trust uh, the governments, we cannot trust the elites, people in power. So is there maybe some kind of way that uh, we can change the infrastructure of the, of the, let's say, transmission of information? So we are somehow resilient to, to the, the censorship. In a sense, uh, a lot of, uh, I, I heard that the CIA was doing that and the American like government was, trying to fight censorship in authoritarian regimes by throwing the, I don't know, like the tapes with, with, uh, for promoting ideologies of democracy and similar things. So I'm, I'm just thinking, okay, you, you mentioned the Bahamas and uh, uh, shouldn't we just, uh, uh, how, how to say, shouldn't we just demand transparency in all these things? Because we, there isn't another way. We, we need to shift from, don't be bad for elites to can't be bad in a sense. Yeah, so absolutely. I, I think it's futile to talk, okay, we, uh, what happens if this and that? I think we need to demand infrastructural changes. Uh, that, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I would prefer to do it via law than via armed struggle. So if I were, uh, if I were asked, how would you like to have this change? I prefer law and of course, there are laws that say you should not evade taxes. The same laws that say that also say, but under these conditions, you can move money over 10 companies via Panama legal office to the Virgin Islands and the Bahamas, and you don't have to pay tax. Now, who wrote those laws, right? When were they made? We need to kind of get into, if we talk about investigative journalism, not just in who are the names on these papers, but by which laws, have, has this become legal? An interesting case in Germany, there was a, a politician who earned a lot of money as a commission for securing a deal with um, uh, face masks at the start of the COVID pandemic. And in Bavaria, the government said, these particular masks, FFP2 masks, are from now on compulsory. That guy took a, a bribe, of course, also voted for it. It was all exposed. And... He was also um, not found not guilty because it was legally allowed to do so. The next question that should be asked, hasn't been asked, but should be asked is who voted for these laws? Who wrote these laws that this was legal to bribe politicians? Who promoted that legislation? Who voted for it? And this is why I think your point about transparency is very important. Transparency allows us and uh, academics or journalists or other intellectuals, not maybe to teach people what they should be doing, we can't, but it could help us uh, discover connections like forensic, forensic scientists, right? Discover connections that show that a crime has been committed and can also point towards the, the, um, the criminals involved. And we have to take this as crime. We have to take 
And it's not just Putin. It's not just Trump. And our local local politicians may also be involved in crime, right? And I think crime has infested and infected politics all over. It's not just the rich people at the top. Everybody who takes a bribe is like that. And but if we take it as a moral issue, then you know, be good. Yeah, yeah, I'll be good. Right? That's not going to solve it. Take it as a legal issue. Then and so the law. It still has, if you like, laws still have the capacity, at least, to challenge. And even if you lose the challenge, because somehow it was still legal to take a bribe and vote as a politician for this, for that which you've been bribed to do. It's still legal. It exposes the fact that it happened. It exposes the fact that it is, was legalized, that there was a piece of legislation passed that it is OK to buy yourself a politician. I'm not saying the world will change, but these are the little, the little steps that we used to call emancipation, but as basically is the system, using the system against itself, mm. right? The system itself is not a perfect oiled machine. It, it, in the lie, there is also something that, that, is, that they want us to believe, right? They want us to believe that they're honest. So if you can show that they're dishonest, there is a problem. Then this guy who said, yes, well, maybe I wasn't particularly honest, but at least it was legal, then legal dishonesty doesn't make it morally better. It just exposes that, that the law has been abused for the purpose of bribing politicians. And I'm sure this is not just in Germany the case, this is everywhere. So if we, for example, go for corruption, we may actually have a little, more, little bit more impact than if we open a new channel on Telegram and tell people the truth. Uh, thank you for your answer. I agree on that part. Definitely, litigation is a is a very big part. Maybe for some uh, cope as a light motif of, of today's uh, all the discussions. I would also add that uh, anybody um, willing to find some inspiration in literature, uh, I think the queer anarchist perspective is also definitely interesting. The mutual aid perspective, and maybe Ursula Le Guin, the solar pond perspective, can also provide you with some. Examples of a post-apocalyptic world world where people out of just pure um, a pure desperation have to work together, not because of reason, because we are very smart. Obviously, as we have pointed out today multiple times, the discussion we are very aware of the, the, the crises that are happening, but in the end, maybe it is desperation and uh, pure need that pushes us into mutual aid. Um, I also saw, oh, huh. so one hand is down, I guess the, uh, the question was answered, then we still have time for another question coming here uh, from in person, Dario, please. So, uh, I found a point that's... Uh, yeah, we will say it louder now. Yes, yes, uh, I found your point that... Uh, okay. I found your point that uh, rich people uh, do not have the do not have the confidence in their power to direct uh, to direct uh, let's say the direction that humanity is going to get past uh, the calamities that are looming. I found it interesting because uh, a question occurred to me: What sort of group would be able to do that? What sort of group would be able to steer us away from these calamities? Yeah, so uh, the the rich the the filthy rich mentalities, of course, not to steer the entire humanity away from calamities. They what they want is to escape it, right? So they, according to Bruno Latour in in the early nineteen eighties, they realized that the Club of Rome report was ten years old at that time was true. This world, the way the world worked, was unsustainable. That was a realization that could lead to two things. Either you, you put all your effort into making the world more sustainable or you're planning to leave the planet. And they chose the second. So what we see in the time that actually there was time for action, it could have been repaired. Instead, we went to hyper catastrophic capitalism, right? The neoliberal turn radicalized. Um, and so, so it's it's so they're steering their rockets. They're trying to get their rockets off, off this planet and and find a new. This is not this is not fantasy. This is of course 
the story of uh, of don't look up but it is why are they interested in space travel they're not interested in exploring other planets they're interested in putting people into planes into rockets um, and develop space programs why is that right there can only be one answer they want to escape and so they are not about emancipation they're about survival now we are also about survival that's why emancipation for me is not the word it's survival and 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 like i say the saving grace is that the vast majority of us are not planned to be on those rockets right so we are bound to this planet we are bound to earth we are bound to surviving or or giving up and then um i think with with the look up story it is they didn't give up they didn't give up even until the last minute right they kept on finding looking for ways and the disaster comes with many faces and then every time it poses a challenge but what i don't want people to think is well it's all big you know this is putin trump whatever it's also small it's also in your own village it is in your own city it is in maybe if you're a member of a political party in your own party right it, the mentality is not of a little elite it's uh, the mentality is is a disease that we're all uh, exposed to and don't let it fester into your heart that you may be that you may manage to get onto one of those rockets. That I think is the difference. Mm -hmm. um, I will hear, yeah. Um, thank you so much for really uh, a stimulating, very uh, uh, perspective. Uh, I found the Lacanian uh, twist of uh, also seeing the corruption in the, in the small person, uh, Malik Shoryek, as we would say it here in Croatian, uh, very refreshing actually. Unfortunately, we have no more time uh, to pose any questions because we have to continue with the symposium.